in the Old Testament, it begins with a very simple phrase. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It shows the omnipresence of God. He is always in present tense. He has no beginning. He has no ending. But with us, it's introduced by saying, in the beginning. And then it says, His power, God, created. There is nothing that God can't do. All the power of everything everywhere is held by the sovereign, providential hand of Almighty God. So He is always in present tense. He is always the most powerful, can do all things. And He is omniscient. means He knows everything. God created everything in the heavens and in the earth. Now in the heavens and the earth, we understand and we see the power of God. We see the ways of God. And everything that we have down here is ordered from the largest to the smallest. From our galaxy where we have a planet, the sun, that, that we rotate around and it gives us the right amount of heat in the summer and the right amount of cool in the winter and these little beautiful days in between. Have y'all liked it lately? I tell you what, it just, everybody needs to have their own thermostat, especially in church. Amen? And, 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 and I want my own thermostat, and this was what my thermostat would kind of be set on right now. I love it. I love it. God puts all of that in his hand, but he also puts the smallest atom, the smallest little thing that's out there that is the building block of everything else in all the universe comes down to the very small. And if you want to, you can look inside the atom and you'll see the identity of each and every little thing. Uh, uh, my wife and I uh, did this thing called 23 and Me. Anybody familiar with 23 and Me? The 23 chromosomes from the man, the 23 chromosomes from the woman that come together and make life. And, and it tells me, uh, it told me who I was and where I was from. And by the way, I've got like one tenth of one percent from Pakistan. <laughs> Y'all are going to look at me different from now on, aren't you? I am from Pakistan too. I don't know where they get all those things and how they know all those things, but I just want you to know God knows all those things. God, we serve a God who is very detailed and he is very ordered. Have y'all ever noticed that one always comes before two? Beginnings always precede endings. Uh, I think that we got little babies here today. I love that. And we might have a new one. I don't know. But uh, Emily DeFevers, as you all know, is great with child. That's what the Bible talks about it, right? She went to the doctor, I believe it was Thursday or Friday, and we were texting back and forth, and I said, when's that boy coming? And she said, not yet. I think her due date is uh, tomorrow, but they, she has an appointment with the doctor on Tuesday. And, but we heard that she was supposed to be here today. So everybody say, hmm. Jared, my son up there, was born during Sunday school. I had to get up and call one of my friends and said, I need you to preach for me. He says, anything wrong? I said, no, something's good happening. So, you know, it's amazing how also this week, um, you know, we had to say goodbye to, Lee Price said goodbye to his father this week. Not goodbye, see you soon. When he was a believer and he had, Last seven years, he had not had legs. The last 10 years, he'd been in a wheelchair. Uh, not to be the man who did the hunting and the fishing and the outdoor stuff like he always had wanted to be. And folks, you can't scare me with heaven. Heaven's going to be great. The thing I love about heaven is when I get there, everybody's going to love me. Isn't that good? Nobody's going to judge me. Everybody's just going to love me as I am. And well, as God creates me with the regal robes of glory that he will dress me with when I'm there. You know, beginnings and endings can happen at the same time. 
There's always some stage of life that we're going through. Some of you here have been in this uh, life for a while, and by that, you've gone through much pain. You've made a few mistakes, whether you want to admit them or not. You've had some great joys, but yet, as we go through these things, we learn that life just is ordered and continues on. We take baby steps before we climb mountains. We have to learn to read before we can write novels. It's just a continuation and moving forward. So for every great joy, there will also be great loss and pain. And for every mistake, there will also be opportunities that we can learn from. There are many things that we go through in life that are if-then. If you do this, then this will happen. If you do something else, then something else will happen. There are many forks in the road. There are many times that we will need to take leaps of faith. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that the only way we can please God is by faith. And faith means I don't see it, I don't understand it, I don't know it, but I believe in it and I'm going to act upon it. Have y'all ever seen those people jump off a cliff and they have like a little Batman suit on? And they're, I've always wondered how in the world did they do that the first time? <laughs> Amen. When I learned to ride a bike, I fell a few times. You jump off a cliff with one of those Batman suits, you better have it down pat first. You're going to learn what the word splat means if you don't. You know, there are times that we just need to take a leap of faith and just say, here I go, Jesus, I'm holding on to you. But there are also times that we go through stagnant periods. And we need to learn from that. And we need to know that even during those stagnant periods, periods, God can make a way. Kill, if you would, let's put up Ephesians first here. Before we get to Mark, I just wanted to remind you of what God's Word said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Are y'all okay with every spiritual blessing? Are you okay that God desires good for you? That He loves you with an endless love? There's, there's nothing that He would not do for you? God is an amazing, amazing God, and He wants to share it with us. Verse 4, just as He chose us, humanity, in Him before the foundation of the world, before He made Adam and Eve, He had a plan for our life. He had a plan for them. He has a plan for me. He has a plan for you. He has from a, a plan for my granddaughter that's already here. And He's also got a plan. You can get that for her. All pacifiers will be returned at New Holland Baptist Church. He's also got a plan for my grandchildren that are not even here yet. Valerie, you should have said amen to that. <laughs> he knows and chooses to bless for us. Look what it says. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame, before Him. I'm a sinner. He's in heaven. God can't have a relationship with sin. So He knew the salvation process from the beginning, that I could be holy. Think about that. Sinner that I am can be made righteous in Jesus so that I could spend my eternity with Him in heaven. Having predestined, he wanted this. The plan of salvation was set up before we, were, before we knew anything about it. Predestined us to adoption as sons. I get to be a child of God. Not because of how great I am, but because of how great He is. According to the good pleasure of His will. God has a plan for us. He's ordered it. He shaped it, and listen to me, church, and He keeps it. He keeps it. Now, I'm going to begin a series here, and we're going to be looking in the book of Mark. 
And as we study the book of Mark, we will see the unfolding of God's plan for us. It says in the book of Mark, in chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The word beginning there means the origin. The origin of the good news of God for us is in Jesus Christ. We couldn't make God do it, but God had it planned for us. It's the unfolding of the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus means Jehovah saves. Christ means the anointed one. So Jesus came to be the anointed Savior for us. Church, can I just pause for a second and say, we have said the word saved and salvation so much that we forget the full meaning of it. We forget how amazingly drastic and and wonderful it's not just that he would turn heaven and earth he turned that for us he left heaven to come to earth to die a death that he did not deserve that he should have never had to know but because of his love he did it for us but because He is a God of order. He had some things planned. Look what it says in verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, this is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. All right, now church, let's let's, let's listen now. Let's, Let's get the point here. He had it planned ahead of time for us, detailed for us. One comes before two, everything shaped, everything fashioned, nothing out of order, everything working in his will. He sent one ahead to prepare the way. This is the, uh, in that day, everybody knew it was a, an emissary of the king who would go ahead to make sure that things were safe, that things were taken care of, that, that the, the paths were straight. He would take the high points and lower them down, the low points and raise them up. He, he would make sure that when the king came, he would receive the acceptance that he deserved. That's what John the Baptist was. Let's talk about John the Baptist here for just a moment. It says in verse 4, John came baptizing. That is what we would think of as the word conversion. Matter of fact, if you were a Gentile and you wanted to be be, um, a, a Jew to come into the Jewish religion, you had to be baptized. Same way that we do it today, by the way. The word baptize, immerse. Immerse. For all of y'all that just got a little touch of it, we got a baptismal pool up here. I can get, I can get all of you under. <laughs> Amen? Just try me. I might, I might have to leave you down there for a second to get you all under there, but I'll get you all under and I'll bring you back up. It may, now look, I don't want a, a sprinkling of Jesus. I want to be immersed in Christ. There are so many people who say that they're Christians that they just want a little dab of Jesus in their life. But what I need is Lord, Master, Savior, Keeper, and I need one that will never leave me or forsake me. Look what it says here. He says he will prepare. He came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. Folks, that is the salvation story right there. Repent and be saved. Repentance is believing in God, turning from your sin, and walking in a new way of life. No conversion, no change. No change, no salvation. No heaven, just hell. You can talk with your mouth all you want to, but what you are made new by Christ is what you really are. It's the same in the Old Testament 
They were, they were repenting of their sins because all of us must repent of our sins. They were turning from, from their way to God's way as they looked forward to what God would do. Today, we don't look for, we look forward to heaven, but we look back to what, to what Jesus did on the cross that made it possible. But we're do, both doing it by repentance of our sins. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen? How many is all? You too. Matter of fact, I'm not sure that you're not in trouble after what you say to your wife up here this morning. There, there will be a, there will, oh, you're good. Yeah, you hold on to that thought. <laughs> there will be repentance this afternoon, I promise. Look what it says in verse 5. When John came preaching about our sins and that we need to repent, I love this. It was a preparation because it says in verse 5, then all the land of Judea, wow, from every place in Judea, and those from Jerusalem, they went out to him in the wilderness, it said in verse 4, and were all baptized, all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins in the old dirty muddy waters of the Jordan River remember when Elisha was in the Old Testament and the leper came to him he was sent to him and he he said how can I be cleansed from my leprosy and he said go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times in the river he said all the places that we have up in Damascus that are beautiful waters why can't I go there and he got mad then a little servant girl said you know if if he asks you to do something great, you do it. He just asks you to do something that seemed inconvenient. So people from all over this area were going to John. They were having to, to go long distances, and they were going to the wilderness, and they were hearing these sermons, and it wasn't making them feel jolly and joyful and good. It was making them feel condemnation because of their sins. And it says here they went to John repenting. Look what it says there at the end of that verse confessing their sins. I wonder what our attendance would be like if you came to to receive Jesus' salvation and I gave you a microphone and said, okay, you come up here now. Now tell everybody what you've been doing. Mm -hmm, That's what I think too. (laughs) That's exactly what I think. I think my uh, uh, invitations would, would be hard. But you know what else I know? with the hand of God on their heart, some would do it. Now, I don't want you to confess to me. I'm not your priest. I want you to confess to him. If you confess to me, all I can do is turn around and pray to God for you. But if you confess to him, he's the one that can change you and will change you. Forevermore, he'll change you. There's some awfully good things that can happen, folks. There's some awfully amazing things that can happen So what happened here was to prepare the way for Jesus, somebody had to come tell them the story, get them ready. There's something that needed to happen. One had to come before two. Something had to prepare their hearts and lives to be ready for what Jesus would do in their life. Let's talk about this person that was preaching the message. Verse 6, John was clothed with camel hair. By the way, that's not a leather coat, that's camel hair. Stinky camel hair. A leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Mm -mm. We're having fall gathering on September 8th, and we're going to have a meal after church. Don't y'all bring no locusts and wild honey. Because what you bring, you'll probably take home with you. I mean, there may be a couple people in here say, I'll try it. How would you like to have a steady diet of locusts? Anybody in here like eating bugs? No, I'm not. Do what? No. I mean, I might have eaten one when I was two years old and I didn't know better. Don't y'all act so holy. Y'all ate mud pies. I mean, anybody in here taste mud? 
Mm-hmm. You know, what I see here is I see somebody who did not care about the things of this world. He wasn't worried about the, the clothes of this world. He wasn't worried about the acceptance of this world. He wasn't worried about the comfort of this world. He wasn't worried about the diet of this world. What he lived was there was a commission on his life that was more important. There are too many people. Oh, and by the way, y'all, have y'all noticed we got a, a, a political election coming up? This group over here is going to promise everything. Oh, hold on. This group over here is going to promise everything. Now, they're going to promise one thing, and they're going to promise another thing, and they're probably not going to give us anything. Are y'all good with that? (laughs) It's not about what we receive except from God. Look at John's message, verse 7. He preached saying, therefore comes one. Y'all look up there on the screen. Y'all see that? That one is in a a capital letter, which means it's speaking of Christ, God. There comes one from God, the Son of God, after me, who is mightier than I. I love the humility here. Whose sandal straps I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. We need to live a life beneath God, serving God, one who is so much greater than us. You know, most of the time people just say, what can you do for me? Jesus has already done it for me. I just want to, out of gratitude, I just want to see what I can do for him. I just want to love him and serve him with all my heart. He says, I indeed baptize you with water, but he, capital H, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I will give you the very one that strengthens Christ will strengthen you. The very one who will sustain God's work in Jesus, church, listen, will sustain you. He'll be with you. He'll help you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. Come on now. God has a detailed plan for your life. He has ordered your days. He knew you before you were born. He gave you your personality. He knows you're 23 and me. He puts you here for a purpose. You're a snowflake. There's nobody else like you in all the world. So that he can do a God work in and with and through you. He'll make it happen if you let him. Now verse 9, in those days. It came to pass in those days that Jesus... Jehovah saves, came from Nazareth, a forgotten, overlooked city of Galilee, just a bunch of blue-collar folks, and was baptized, the perfect one, by John in the Jordan. What you're going to find out is in the book of Mark, He's not going to go into a lot of the details that Matthew and Luke went into. He's just going to get to the main point of it. So he just says, Jesus came. And when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, verse 10, he immediately, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. A voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am, y'all say it with me, well pleased. This is my boy. He's going to go through a lot of pain for you. He will love you like you've never been loved before. You're going to treat him in the worst way possible. But I'll take care of him. And if you'll let me, I'll take care of you. I'll bless him, the anointed one. But that anointed one will bless you in a way that is amazing. Now hear this. Verse 12, immediately... The Spirit drove him into the wilderness, that is Jesus. And he was there in the wilderness because of God's plan, because God allowed it. He was in the wilderness 40 days, the the number for judgment, 40. Tempted by Satan himself, a showdown. 
This could have been bad. Jesus could have, he was human, he could have given in to sin like Satan did. But praise God he didn't. He came not to join sin, he came to defeat sin. With pain, anybody want to fast for 40 days? Anybody want to live among the wild animals for 40 days? Anyone, anybody want to face Satan himself bringing all the crafty, cunning sins against you? How many of us would fall? Oh my, I am a sinner. I have clay feet, but not Jesus. And then it says, and the angels ministered to him. The Holy Spirit was with him, empowering him, leading him, guiding him. Angels ministering to him. All right, come on now. Let's, let's, let's bring this home. All this is about preparing the way. Preparing the way. It had been pre-planned, but it still had to be lived out. You have been pre-planned. When I was seven, before I was even saved, God gave me an experience with someone who was my cousin. And what I found myself doing was I found myself talking, encouraging, comforting, sharing what God could do as a lost person. Did not even know him as my Savior yet, but intellectually I knew. And at seven years old, I heard in my spirit, God said, this is what I'm going to do with your life. Now, folks, you've heard my testimony. I didn't want to be a preacher. When I got thinking about it, I was looking back on that experience. But God was preparing me even then. I, I've gone through so many things that happened. I, I, I accepted, that I submitted to the call of God to be a pastor when I was 24. But before then, I came this close to death, not once, not twice, many times. I had a fan, a, a, a 48 inch exhaust fan in the wall of a carpet mill and it had louvers on the outside of it. It blew out and it did not have a guard around it. And I was driving my dad's brand new car that day. I don't even remember why. And I had the windows rolled down on it and a summer thunderstorm came up. So I crawled up on some ro rolls of carpet. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say a roll of carpet, 12 foot long. And it was about that thick. And there was about six or seven of them. And I've been crawling on carpet rolls my whole life. And I crawled up it and I was going to look down outside the fan to see if I rolled up the windows on the car. And I had to look down through the louvers like that. And the, and, and the roll shifted on me, and I went face first into that fan, and it knocked me about 10, 12 feet. And all I knew was I was bleeding. And what I didn't realize was that I went to the bathroom, okay? And, and I had to walk through all these ladies who were putting binders on carpet. And, and they were like little sewing machines putting binders on. And I walked through all of them, and they're like, because I was... Every breath in, every breath out was blood, just like this. So I went to the bathroom, and I got a paper towel, and I looked at it and went, I'm okay. And I went back out, and this lady came to me, and she said, let me see, let me see, let me see. So I let her see, and she said, oh, we're going to the hospital. I said, oh, no, I'll be fine. Isn't that crazy what men do? Boys. And, and she said, no, 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 we're going to the hospital. And I went to the hospital, 
and they bandaged me up and I had to have surgery the next morning. By the way, my mom came in and she looked at it and she said, he's going to be a hair lip. And I am a hair lip. I have hair on my lip. So. The doctor told me, he said, you came about a quarter of an inch of your head just busting open like a pumpkin. And I said, well, praise God. Got hit by a transfer trailer, tractor trailer. Boom, right? I'm all right. I'm tough, evidently. No, I'm just blessed. I hit a wire around my throat. Motorcycle with a CC bar on the back. Y'all know what a CC bar is? And it locks down and it won't roll back because it's in gear. And I got a CC bar keeping it. And I'm sitting there trying to not choke. If y'all look, y'all can still see my scar on my. I went through, fell off the house on my head, praise God. There's, I, when I was young, I took a whole bottle of pills because they tasted like candy. I crawled up on the counter and ate the whole bottle. I got to get my stomach pumped. They didn't know if I would be deformed or not. I think I am. I cannot tell you how many times I've come this close. But God's providential hand was with me. Now, I can do one of two things. I can live myself, my life for me, or I can let God use me in His plans. I can just let things happen as if they happen, or I can take them and say, God is going to do a work in my life, with my life, through my life. Yes, my life. So Lord, prepare the way for me. And let me make a choice, clear out some stuff so that you can use me. Anybody ever planned a garden? You don't just go out there and dig a hole. Matter of fact, if you're wise, you'll start in the fall. And then sometime in maybe the very first of February, you're going to get that ground just right. And then you've got to plant it whenever you plant it. And you've got to work it. And how many of you know that if you don't work it, it will work you? Prepare the way. Plan the way. I understand that everyone that's hearing my voice will say, there's not really much good about me. God can use Craig so much better than he can use me. And God can use Craig. But God loves you and wants to use you. God wants to save you. He wants to bless you. He wants to put you in perpetual blessing and love and joy. But it's not just for you. We live in a community and the opportunity is there. Church, we better prepare the way. Prepare the way for others. Face things as they are. But know that God has so much good for you. What happens if we don't? We miss the opportunities. What happens if we're stagnant? We get more of the same. Growth can be painful. Use can be painful. In Sunday school this morning, we studied that Jesus went through more pain than we'll ever know because it was part of the process of being a blessing. When I got saved, I was happy. Oh, was I happy. I was ecstatically pleased that, that, that Jesus Christ came and took away all that guilt of my sin. And they told me, you need to read your Bible. You need to tell others. You need to learn to pray. And I had the great tool of taking Jesus with me to school the next day. Ten-year-old evangelist. Let's play baseball. Yeah, let's play baseball. Let me tell you what happened to me at church yesterday. 
This is the working of God's hand. God has already prepared the ground. God is already wanting to work the field. We're the laborers. The field is already wide in the harvest. We get the joy. I'm going to experience something I've never experienced before. I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to see someone there that unbeknownst to me, I didn't know really anything about it, but they're going to come to me and they're going to say, Brother Brian, because of you, I'm here. Does that sound good? Because of you, Sarah, I'm here. While I was going through something, you were there to be a blessing to me, to help me, to encourage me. The greatest force in the world is God, through Jesus, touching people's lives and using them for the glory of God. The greatest joy that we can have is saying, here am I, Lord, send me, use me, help me. It's time to prepare the way. That means joining God in what he's already doing.